And we should point out that Gene is an actual outfitter in Ely, and this was an awesome thing that he did for us. We see a couple people hiding, John. Come down, please. And I know Sarah is here, too. Sarah, where are you? With your new haircut. Fine. There you are. Uh, I'm John Glyme, and I was a colorist. I'm actually Emily. Yeah, yep. <laughs> Emily Dooley, and I was Kim. Questions that are popping up here. You guys here. Yes, uh, at the gas station at the end, the gentleman uh, packing the plan, was he driving the pickup truck? No, he wasn't. He okay. was, actually. <laughs> like, uh, the, was it the same pickup truck that Travis originally drove earlier in the last episode? He wasn't. Because I saw the board in the window. No, nope. I'm totally unrelated. My, uh, my final question. Earlier when he switched the license plates, was he trying to pry off the VIN number off the front? And he was. And when you ran the errand and he came back with a bag and threw it into the woods, what was that? Littering. Littering. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So he, he, he went there to he, he cleaned out all identification, registration, mail, anything in there that would tie, tie back to Thanks. Question Art. for you and or John, I guess. Um, so about two scenes from the end, when the color suddenly sort of lightened up and changed, I, it didn't, I thought the storyline was kind of going in the dark direction, and then the sun came out. Can you talk a little bit about that? What's the significance of that? Yeah, I think that's, uh, oddly enough, I had that same thought up there. You're talking about from when they drove away, and then we go back to the wilderness? Uh, yeah, I guess. Right, yeah, what happened there was uh, on the day we decided to shoot that the, uh, the, the, the fire on the, on the island there, this, the sun came out. <laughs> <laughs> That's about it. <laughs> okay, there's more than just that. I mean, part of it I, I could have pulled back on the, on the chroma and brought it back to be more gray and dismal, but part of it was to sort of harken back to the good times where they had first visited uh, the Boundary Waters, and that was when I tried to make the color most vibrant, and when they were happy and learning to paddle, and you know, all, of, all of that stuff. And so it was, you know, it, things get so dark and gray by the end, it's sort of remembering, oh yeah, this is what, what that was like. And so that was, so when I was working on the grade for those shots at the end, I was looking more at what we had at the middle of the film rather than where we had gotten to at the gas station, back in civilization, away from nature, that sort of thing. So not just that it was a sign. <laughs> no, and that is actually true. John controls all aspects of color. He, I mean, if we wanted to make that dark, he would have made it dark. That, that was a conscious decision. Question in the back there? Hey, Toll, I was wondering if you could uh, talk about the uh, role the IRRB played in uh, the film's production, and did you have was that a big incentive for you? Uh, you know, it, it again, I, these guys talked about it too, but it, w it was just kind of luck of the draw for one thing. Um, we, we didn't shoot up there because of the I, because of the incentive. I, I, the IRRB also, in addition to the snow bait, uh, the snow bait we were twenty five percent back <coughs> on everything we spent in the state for for the most part, and then. The IRRB, which is the Iron Range Resource Rehabilitation Board, which is kind of charged with uh, economic development up in, in north northern Minnesota, um, have it, they have an additional twenty percent rebate for anything you spend up there. Um, so that you know, in the in the end, that was a very significant um, impact on our on what we were able to spend and. And they also helped us with uh, the, the IRRB board. Uh, the IRRB board also helped us with with scouting the locations. Uh, anything we needed, they would we could rely on them, and they would help us out. Yeah, and you know, 
some of the biggest expenses on the production are food and lodging. And because three out of our four weeks were shot in Ely, we knew that there'd be those huge chunks uh, that we would get that additional money back. So it ended up being a, a significant thing. And I don't know if there were many choices that we made where we, we I know, you know, we bought hard drives in, in Ely instead of down at Best Buy in Minneapolis because we knew we'd get an additional bit back. It also, you know, we had to decide there are things that we could have shot in either the Twin Cities or Ely, and we started to push a couple more things into Ely, uh, and that was one of the reasons why. So definitely a, a, a big boon for us. I'll just add that I do think that while this film was, you know, we were going to shoot in Ely, whether the Night Trip review was there or not, after that experience, I would make an effort to shoot another movie up in that region, and I'm very familiar with the map now. So, I mean, it, 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 it works, you know, I mean, it was, they made it very easy, I mean, and, and they helped us, and so I would certainly, I mean, I think these sort of rebates and, and incentives do make a difference in terms of where people shoot, particularly if you're dealing with a, a story that, you know, can take place different places. I mean, this one was very much sort of Boundary Waters was a character, but there are a lot of stories that I think could take place in any number of towns or areas up there, so I think, I think they, they work. And, and, and given that I think this is the for the legislature right now, I'll give you a little more propaganda, which is to say that I'm originally from Iowa, and, uh, and <laughs> uh, but when it comes to film rebates, uh, and a couple of people asked me who came up from my hometown to see if I, you know, they, they, they mentioned they asked if we ever filmed something in Iowa, and the fact is probably not until they get a, a, a decent rebate um, or any rebate legislation through there. So I, it, it does impact uh, where people film. Gene was absolutely amazing, and the funny thing was that you know if, if you're familiar with film production, is you have numerous kind of setups. You'll know, do it, get the camera set up one angle, and you do a bunch of takes. And for whatever reason, we did a lot of takes from this first angle, uh, and, and it took a while. And I think I, I started to see like Gene's eye twitch, and 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 things were getting. It was, it was kind of a long start, a hard start, and then we then we're like, okay, next move on to the next setup, which basically meant we're going to do the same scene but a different angle. Gene came over to me and was like, oh. was like Woo, that was a tough one. I mean, this has been fun. I'm like, I mean, actually, about another four or five hours. <laughs> <laughs> I was dragging. <right. laughs> tough work, tough work. Um, any questions about it? Yeah. Uh, just speak a little bit about the casting. Have you worked with some of the folks before? Uh, the, the casting, we, we did. We kind of did a, a, a grassroots effort, um, mainly kind of headed up by Mike, and and then Kevin and me were involved too. But Mike was really out there working hard to do. We just I don't want to say we like hand picked, but we, we really spent a lot of time focusing it on. on we, we didn't also you know really didn't have the budget and thank I'm kind of thankful we didn't have the budget for a casting director, and so of course it's to get out there and get creative and we. The two leads we ended up casting out of LA, um, you know, simply because they 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 were very passionate about the project and we were impressed with with their their uh, auditions, and they were you know, foolish enough to actually want to do it or go up to the wilderness for several weeks. Uh, but you know, in terms of the uh, the rest of the cast, I mean, we just we were very careful about who we who we cast. We use some of the local agencies, and and I know Mike is more hands on there. You can talk. Yeah, um, our priority was the two leads. You know, the, the, they're in pretty much every scene of the film, and so that occupied most of our attention for the kind of couple months leading up. Uh, once we found them, we went to Wayman and more two agencies here, uh, and 
And we had some of the people in the sporting world audition for the leads, and they were great. Uh, but we ended up, thankfully, having being able to take advantage of them um, and put them in, in different slots. And because it was like just us and a very small production team, kind of doing everything ourselves. Um, by the end, it, we ran out of steam a little bit. And we ended up taking some of our cast and throwing them in here and there. And um, it's really like a piecemeal approach. Uh, but certainly, once we got the two leads, everything else started to fall in place. So, two two subject. The water thing is a whole, you know, seminar. Uh, yeah, we'll we'll give that to Toll. Um, but as far as like the general logistics, one, like you said, we need to have a very tiny crew. We need to have a dedicated crew. Uh, who and so in the vetting process, I you know made sure to uh, really hammer home like how much do you like pain? How much do you like being cold and wet? And how much do you want to make a movie? Uh, that really is what it came down to. Like they had to really want it and it had to mean something to them. Um, and we fortunately got a group of people like Christian and the rest of the crew who really wanted to be there and that made everything else, the things that seemed like insurmountable challenges, easy. The other thing was, uh, you know, we, we, there were certain locations that were like a half hour hike in and mostly I was thinking about like twisted ankles, like one person twists an ankle and that's, that's trouble if it's an actor or a DP or sound guy. Um, so we tried to just prepare people the most and we also tried to make sure that we never scheduled more than like one of those a week and that those would be scheduled at the end of the week. So, you know, a really tough day, we could rest afterwards. Um, and yeah, maybe you can talk about the shooting on the water. Yeah, so the shooting on the water was uh, very, uh, in, in hindsight, it was uh, it makes for a great story, but we were very stressed about le leading up was, uh, the ice out. If, if you're from Minnesota and not from Iowa, you would know that uh, ice out occurs when the, when, the, when the ice starts to break up on lakes. and. And that was a big concern of ours because we had to be there right at ice out because we knew if we came between ice out and the bugs, is a, we've got about a four or five week window. And the previous year, I think it had been a record uh, late ice out. And then a year or two before that, it was a record early ice out. So we thought, oh, you know what? It's got to go back to the averages during our year. <laughs> <laughs> but it did lock out. I mean, it was a late one. Right. Yeah. Yeah, it was, it was late, but we just we just hit it perfectly. Um, and and then the, you know the other thing in terms of like the logistics of shooting on there, but and, and Mike and I have worked on other uh, projects together. And one thing one, one thing we learned was that you don't want to start off with the first day with a really intense scene. You got to kind of ease into it. So Mike, and, you know, we, we we thought, well, let's just start like a casual. Let's start with those casual scenes where they're on the water talking. Just and so Mike said, okay, so call times of 3, 4, 3.30 a.m. on a frozen, partially frozen lake. Uh, the first call time, the first day of shooting. And so that, that's Mike. Um, so we, we did that, and that was very very uh, tough one to throw me into because I, not only am I need, need to focus on these performances, and luckily the actors were more professional than me, so I didn't have to worry about them in the end, but I also had to worry about trying to get these boats to line up the right direction and going the right way and and then also as we learned later we had to worry about these sheets of ice that the size of football fields that were coming down and potentially capsizing us and then we would meet our maker underneath this ice but it was good thanks Mike yeah. <laughs> you know in, in my defense and to speak to the logistics again uh, when you're working with the SAG actors you have required turnaround times, and so you can't shoot a 6 a.m. call time one day and a 5 a.m. the next day. You need to start early and stagger later. So I had no choice, and it was, you know, it's tough. You want to start with an easy day where you can start at 9 a.m. and you do a couple shots of actors walking from the car to the to the coffee shop or whatever and just kind of get in the swing of it, but there's, there's really, there's no choice sometimes, uh, and that's sort of what we were faced with there. And, it, you know, what, what it came down to is having a support crew and uh, a DP and camera team who were incredible and willing and able to, uh, you know, the ice went out, we had like one day to practice, to do all those camera tests, um, and we needed to teach ourselves how to make a movie on the water in one day. And that's sort of the part of the, the difficulty of something like this, but also the fun of it is like, you are jumping into the deep end and you just gotta find a way to do it. Uh, and so it was definitely an adventure, um, but we had a, a good team and pulled it off. 
Yeah, Tola, can you talk about the music a little bit? Was that, uh, in, were they uh, original music and where are the musicians from? Um, yeah, we, uh, so the, 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 the composer is, he, he's based out of Portland. It was all independent, all original. And um, through my advanced kind of a, a, a network of, a professional network of people, I met this guy, which is based, I, I met him, he's a, met him through his brother-in-law, who was the father of another kindergartner goes to my <laughs> son. But that shows you how I'm always thinking. So, but, uh, so he, he, he's, he, it was a summer after we shot it, and then this guy's like, you, have you found music? And he said, no, not yet. I said, no. And he gave me his, his brother-in-law's information, and I looked him up and checked out his music, and it was exactly what I wanted for the film, talked to him, and like every person we got involved in the film, I realized he was a, a, someone who was great personality, would be great to work with. Um, we give a lot of give and take, uh, didn't have a big ego, and and that's exactly what he turned out to be. It was amazing. Um, back to the filming on the water, knowing it's the boundary waters and you can't have motors in there, how many canoes did you have at one time out filming? We, we, didn't, we didn't film in the boundary waters. Um, <laughs> we, yeah, it, we didn't film in the Boundary Waters Forest Service. Uh, won't let anyone because it's designated wilderness. They won't let anyone film in there. Really, I mean, really yeah, it's anyone. Um, and so we had to film on just on the kind of on the uh, uh, the fringes of, of the of the Boundary Waters. Uh, we ended up luckily uh, the Deer Ridge Resort where we stayed. Uh, the whole crew was on Garden Lake, uh, and it just turned out that that was a great place to film. And so a lot of that was filmed there. We also filmed at uh, Bear. Barrett State Park, a little bit there. Bear Lake State Park. And then also Jim Brandenburg's property was up there. And that's a lot of the beautiful scenics um, are on his property. There's, there's tons of rolling with the bunches, like that is, is gonna happen, but um, one, of, one of my kind of happiest moments on the production was uh, we had this scene where the canoe is propped up and they have the argument underneath it. Um, and in pre-production, we we're scheduling the film and trying to figure out you know, the best time to schedule each scene. And I went to Toll and, and said, uh, you know, that this is a great scene, it's gonna be, deliver some amazing performances. We don't actually need to shoot that in the rain, right? We certainly don't have a budget to create the rain, so the only way to do it would be to magically orchestrate when it rains. Uh, and I said like, so we're, we're good to like, kind of put the, have the canoe be on the ground and they just have an argument, right? And he was like, no, no, we need, we need to do it when it rains. Uh, and you know, my first thought was, are you kidding? Like we, we, we don't have any room to breathe. My, uh, we can't necessarily like take, schedule one scene and wait for it and like adjust everything based on that one scene. My second thought was like, I'm, I'm so glad he said that because that was sort of the moment when I knew that you know, we were in good hands. We were in the hands of a storyteller who was determined to tell the story as, as well as possible and for the mood to be right and the feel to be right. Uh, and so what we did was, you know, with my, myself and Mariko, our AD, and Will, our co-producer, we had a, a late night, no card shifting session, and we were looking at Google Weather, and we, we scheduled that scene on the day where the percentage of rain chance was like 60% instead of 30%. Uh, and we got some rain, and, uh, and, and it worked out. And you know, Tom augmented a little bit and like enhanced the sound, but there was real rain there, and it, and it made sense. So um, you know, we, we got insanely lucky, but it, I, to be honest, it was a combination of, of fortune uh, and an amazing team of people who were able to make things as flexible as possible to be able to make those choices. Yes, we do. Lots of film festivals. We, just, we, we haven't heard back from them yet, but we are. Uh, no, we, we continue to submit, and you know it's kind of a rolling admissions kind of thing. Yeah, I was gonna say we. So we just uh, played a River Run in North Carolina, which is great. Uh, we finished the film like a week, like three days before we had to deliver to them and to and to MSPF. Uh, and so now we've submitted the final cut to a bunch of summer and fall festivals. So we'll be uh, hopefully having a, a fun and healthy festival run uh, later in the summer and fall. Uh, and we, you know, we've got our website, heartofwilderness.com, Facebook, Heart of Wilderness, um, and there will be plenty of updates and more screenings there. And just quickly, I just want to also just 
say that everyone on this cast and crew had, had big hearts. And I mean, it, just looking down here, and Emily Dooley, whose name I do actually know. Um, she, I think of all these stories when I look down here. Emily, as she was, she was, she played Kim, who was drenched in the canoe, uh, as they, as they were, if you remember, there's that little island and off behind it, that's where they were as before we called action. And Kevin had a big bucket of cold water. It was a warm, it was somewhat warm. And she got onto her hands and knees and he poured it onto her and she just said, that's fine, I'll just more, give it, give me more. And, and then Chris Carlson also, didn't he jump in the water? Uh, no complaints ever uh, that I ever heard anyway. Maybe, maybe my cue field. Uh, John, or HDMG, was, he's always at, he, like when we cut the trailer, he's like, oh, color? Yeah, that, you can come in and call new color for that too. Uh, no, no, don't worry about it. Uh, Tom, I mean, like the, like the, 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 the rain, and it, it, he just made the movie complete and full and was, he never complained about uh, uh, having water poured on you. Water poured on you. <laughs> and, and of course, Gene, who just, when I turned to him and said, well, you, do you mind being in the movie? He's like, mm, sure, why not? <laughs> <laughs> and then Christian, who really didn't do much of anything, but then, no, no. <laughs> No, no, Christian was like a star PA, he even let his car star in the, his, his $900 Grand Am that starred at the end. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> they needed a POS and I was happy to him. Yeah. <laughs> and then this guy, who is really the reason that is up there and is as good as it is. Mike is uh, a, a machine in every, in every ride as a producer and as a director and if we didn't have Mike on board, we would, Kevin and I would still just be talking about the movie. <laughs> and then there's Kevin, who's, I've, I've called him before, the king of the fools. I mean, he believed in all of us and is willing to do foolish things to make this happen. Yeah. I want to thank them for bringing their film to us here, for you, the audience, and I'm going to thank the audience, and I want them to thank you for coming, because the film doesn't exist if the audience is not here, so I want to thank you, have a good night, hope you see some more films, and thank you for coming to the festival, thank you.